everybody, thank you all for coming today. So I'm gonna be presenting today on body tempering, mobility, soft tissue work, and sort of just recovery in general, but most importantly, how we use these things here at Kabuki Strength. So I've had a couple of different people refer to me as a mobility guy, a boomstick guy, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about how I've found to best implement these things and these principles. So first we need to talk about what is meant by mobility. So mobility is gonna be your ability without any inhibition of your central nervous system to just get into a position, your flexibility. If you were knocked unconscious, how much you could move your joint and into what positions you could get it. Uh, there are things that are gonna inhibit this and they're all gonna be very focused around damage or trauma. So if you have some sort of major injury, you tear your hamstring, that's gonna come back scarified and very tight. That can inhibit your mobility. If you have joint degradation to where you're working with bone on bone issues, Chris knows all about this. You're gonna have some joint restriction. If you're completely unconscious, you still won't be able to get past that, even though your central nervous system isn't fighting you at all. Uh, surgery would probably be the other big one that'll produce scar tissue because you're actually physically cutting the muscle, the skin, et cetera, and you can see the effects of that all the way up into the skin with the scar tissue forming. So the second piece that goes along with that is gonna be stability, which is your ability to actually control those end range. It's, different to be, uh, it's a difference between being able to get into those positions and actually being able to use them for something. If you can't control those end ranges, it doesn't do you any good to be able to get into those positions. So things that can affect your stability at end range would be just central nervous system, motor control, your ability and your understanding of how to do that, lack of practice, et cetera. Uh, Damage, again, can cause your central nervous system to hold on to things and cause restriction, even if it's not physical restriction, it's neurological restriction that'll prevent you from getting into those positions or being stable in those positions. Uh, repetitive loading or muscular imbalance as a result of repetitive loading can also cause diminished stability and mobility at the same time. And these are all factors that we're gonna look at addressing today. So to break this down for lifters and athletes, like I said, your body needs to be able to get into a position and be able to use those positions under load. You need, so on top of making sure that you have these ranges, you need to be functional at the end of them. And we're going to talk today about how soft tissue work may help improve these and whether or not it's from a neurological standpoint or from a more traditional, often perpetuated standpoint of scar tissue and adhesions. <clears throat> so, there's a common idea that when you don't move a muscle or a muscle just gets very big, very tight, the thing, things are going to get stuck together and they won't move because there is scar tissue there. And then doing things like soft tissue work and foam rolling, using pressure will help break those up. There's a lot of research that doesn't show that that's the case and that, that is a lot harder than that to affect actual change in a muscle. So the model that we've kind of been operating under is the model of neurological effects. When you repetitively load something, the muscle is going to be chronically tight and turned on. And when you do that enough, it won't be able to let go and turn off. <clears throat> so part of how we're going to use this soft tissue work is to help those muscles relax and let go so that you can get into the positions you need to get into, use them safely. So a quick anecdote and how I got started into this sort of thing was back when I first started squatting, I had almost no ability to get into a deep squat without some sort of compensation in my low back and knees, etc. So what I was doing at the time was just foam rolling because I had somebody tell me to get a foam roller. So I would take about two minutes on each of these and I would go slowly up the outsides and insides of my quads and my glutes. And after that, I was able to squat. Now at this time, I wasn't trying to go for peak performance, I was just trying to be able to squat well because that was more important to me than the weight I was moving when I first started lifting. And once I did that, I would not mess around and do nothing for the next half hour. I would immediately go from foam rolling into squatting and loading those positions. So that's how we're gonna talk about making this effective and more useful, is actually loading and using these new ranges that you can unlock with this soft tissue work that we're talking about. So, what you want to be doing is unlocking this range of motion, but then building and gaining mechanical leverage in that range. And how you're going to do that, it's going to look very different for each person. Some people that are just coming off of an injury, loading for them might look like removing restriction and then just being on in a quadruped position, sliding back into a squat position on their knees. Other people, it might look like getting under a 700 pound squat and moving it. It's going to be very different for each individual. Everybody's got different needs. <coughs> 
that's how we're gonna scale some of these things. And from there, I wanna talk about different tools and different methods that you can do this or achieve this by. So everybody's sort of familiar with a regular foam roller or a rumble roller, common everywhere, as well as like a lacrosse ball or a softball. These seem to be the tools that people tend to use the most. And all, there's hundreds of other mobility tools and they all seem to fall into this archetype of something that's shaped like a roller or something that's shaped like a ball. Now the rollers are good for providing this sort of global shearing pressure across a muscle and balls and things of that nature are designed for a more targeted pinpoint pressure. The tools that we have and that we use, like Kabuki Strike, the Boomstick, and the Pain Pill, kind of combine these both because you can use them in the long way and get that same sort of global shearing pressure, or you can use them just with the machined ends and you can get that targeted pressure, which we then use to move after pinning down tissue. <clears throat> so when you're looking at what you're going to do, you need to address what your goal is and what your intent is for this. If your intent is just to feel good, then you can do whatever's gonna make you feel good, but that's not gonna get you a great result out of it. You need to look at, if you're just trying to get your shoulder to be able to move into extension and internal rotation to get to the bottom of a bench without compensating forward so that you're not trashing your shoulder, you need to just achieve that with minimal inhibition and then go load that. So the best way we've found to do this at Kabuki Strength is through using active mobilization, as we've been calling it. So we've been finding high payoff points, taking some sort of implement, generally the boomstick or the pain pill, pinning down these spots and then moving the joint through that range of motion that we're trying to achieve and unlock. So another, and a, big, a good example would be with Chris, he's having a lot of trouble getting into that overhead snatch position. So we found spots, traps, lats, and pecs that tend to open that up for him. So we're not spending 10 minutes on each spot doing deep tissue work. We're just hitting a, a couple of quick intentful reps and then immediately going into stability exercises and then immediately into snatching that same load progression that I've been talking about. <clears throat> and this can be done a myriad of different ways. I think contract, relax, stretching also sort of falls into this. You're gonna affect a lot of change very quickly. You're doing it actively. You're not just hanging on the tissues or just mindlessly smashing out the tissues. I see plenty of people, whether they're in commercial gyms or even here over on the mats, that will just roll back and forth on a foam roller not even really sure what they're trying to achieve themselves, and then they just go into their workout. So that's not to say that just rolling is necessarily a bad way to go about this, but this is what I uh, put under the category of passive mobilizations. <laughs> and with passive mobilizations, if you're not doing them intentfully, you're not going to get much of a response, but what they can be good for is inducing a parasympathetic nervous system response. So as athletes, what we're trying to do is induce as much stress to the body as we can, and then subsequently recover from that stress to cause adaptation in the direction that we want to. So you don't need a parasympathetic nervous system response before you work out when you're trying to amp up and cause load and essentially damage to the tissues. You want to be fired up for that, not down. But after your workout and after you're done at the gym for the day, you need to be back down so that you're not needlessly turned on and using energy that you could be allocating towards your workouts. So the way that we found that you can use these tools in that, this sort of also encompasses deep tissue massage, Swedish massage, all those sorts of things, is this long sustained pressure coupled with breathing properly and breathing slowly into your abdomen to trigger this parasympathetic nervous system response to get your, both your nervous system and your muscles to relax themselves and let go and conserve energy for your next workout where you can fire things back up again and work on getting them active. So the parasympathetic nervous system talk kind of leads us into this idea of just taking care of yourself outside of your training to maximize your, adapt or your adaptive potential. So this covers hydration. A lot of people are using this stuff as triage work and a there's all sorts of little things that you can use to not constantly feel like you need to do this triage work. For some people it's hydration, some people it's lifestyle. There's all sorts of different things that can cause it. So hydration, if you picture even just a steak, which is even dead flesh in itself versus beef jerky, the difference there is gonna be moisture. And if you look at how differently pliable they are, that should give you an idea of what it's like when your tissues are hydrated versus when they're not, even though that's an extreme example. So being adequately hydrated, and not just water intake, but also salt, potassium intake, 
very important for maintaining your pliability and mobility of your tissues. Even that can be simple and cause restriction. The other lifestyle thing that's going to play huge into your recovery is going to be sleep. If you're constantly sleep deprived, stress levels are going to be extra high, and even that can manifest in tissue tightnesses. If you're, a lot of people carry their stress up very high, breathing patterns are not as good. It's also optimal for athletic performance. So this all kind of goes back to the idea of intent and using these things in a way that's going to maximize your recovery when you're not just using them to mobilize for positional improvements. Ideally, you'd be able to come in here and not have to do any of this stuff. As I said before, this is triage work and you want to do this as minimally as possible, but as much as you need to. On top of, excuse me, so using it as triage work is completely fine, but you want to be attacking the variables and the factors that are causing it to be necessary in the first place, whether that's a lifestyle factor, whether that's hydration, anything, repetitive loading, working on muscular imbalances, et cetera. It's not always the answer for issues. Some people, people always come to me with different pains and aches, and they're like, oh, just roll me out, fix me. It doesn't always work that way. There's generally some preceding damage or overloading of tissues in ways that they're not meant to be that will cause that pain. But for some people, just rolling their quads will fix their knee pain, for example. It's something you can always check, but not always the answer. So it's triage work that can help you get away from those pain mechanisms. And that's how we want to use body tempering and soft tissue work. Done. Does anybody have any sort of questions or anything? Tight tissues prior to training, how do they pull joints out of line and is that what causes, for example, knee pain? So if you have tight, tight quads, is it the joint that's actually being pulled out of alignment or is it the actual tissue that's causing the pain? That can be case by case. If your tissues can't move in the way that they're supposed to, it's so like to bend your knee, your quads have to stretch to some degree, correct? If they can't stretch fully, you're gonna find that extra stretch elsewhere, whether it's connective tissue, et cetera, and that can manifest itself as knee pain. It can help, it can cause impingements of nerves, all that stuff. So like I said, case by case. How much pre-training soft tissue work is too much? <laughs> like I said, it's as needed. So when I first started squatting, I, uh, yeah, so we like to keep it under about 10 minutes, but like I said, if you're just getting into lifting and you're completely restricted and can't move well, sometimes you actually need to relax everything to a point where it's not really optimal for performance, but performance isn't always the goal for people. Uh, if you're trying to perform as a high-level athlete, you want to do just enough to be able to perform safely. So what you talked about the neurological effects of tempering a little bit at the beginning. What's the connection between just putting a ton of pressure on one spot and mobilizing a joint in a certain way and the, the nervous system? How, how does that work? There's a couple different theories on that. Part of it is that just the pressure will sort of distract the nervous system while you move it through those joints. Um, there's other theories that it's the stretch receptors in the muscle because you're not stretching it like if you were trying to stretch your hamstrings, but you're still pulling the tissues apart if you're putting pressure to them and creating expansion in that way, if that makes sense. Yeah, and how long does the effect typically last? I mean, everyone sees how drastic the difference is after a session, yeah. but how long does it last? So that's very individual, and that also goes back to the idea of intent. So if you spent an hour working on stuff, you're gonna have a longer lasting effect than if you spent 30 seconds doing it but you need to find what you need, what kind of window of time you need, because if you can affect that change and then load it and stabilize it immediately, you're gonna have all that you need for range and inhibit to the least degree. So if someone is using tempering to just get into a proper position, you know, like a snatch position, what do they need to keep? Do they need to keep tempering to be able to maintain that position or can they then do something else to be in, you know, Make so sure everything's good. That's going to go back to what I said about loading things afterwards. So it's going to be hard to affect a lot of change, according to the research that I've heard people talk about and that I've seen, by just massaging or just pressing into something. But moving and loading is what's going to actually affect change in those tissues. When somebody does their first snatch, 
their body is going to respond totally differently than when they've been snatching for 10 years. And they're going to be much stronger in those positions because they've loaded their tissues in those positions time right. and time again. So just practicing your movement and getting into moving is going to be the best thing you can do for that. So How frequently should you do these soft tissue mobilizations in order to see more permanent changes? Like I just answered to Andre's question, I think it's going to be about loading the tissues afterwards to see permanent changes. I think these are very temporary changes that open windows of opportunity to make permanent changes. How would you define load? Is it enough to goblet squat or do I have to squat heavier? So like I said earlier in the presentation, it's going to vary from individual to individual, but really any type of load, depending on what you're trying to affect and what you're trying to correct. Uh, so for some people, loading is a body weight squat, and for some people, it's a leg press with 700 pounds or whatever. Like, it's going to look different for each individual. So one of the common tempering things that I've seen is just loading up the posterior chain with hundreds of pounds. That's not, there's no movement, it's not active. Yes. How, what, how, what's the effect of that? How so that you're work? talking like Donnie Thompson's right. body tempering stuff, right? Uh, I think that falls into the same category as that long, slow pressure, where you're just holding weight on that muscle, and I think you get that same parasympathetic <clears throat> neurological relaxation effect from it, because it's just that it's that same sustained pressure. It's just not actually moving over the muscles. Do you have a prescription pad? <laughs> no, I'm not a doctor. I don't even pretend to be one. How do you, uh, when you use the boomstick or the pain pill, uh, specifically maybe for a pec, lat, um, how do you pinpoint where to actually yeah. place, the, place the implement? Uh, are you looking for more of an insertion point or an origin or just where, wherever it's tight? So part of that is experience. Um, I've kind of found high payoff areas, but actually through the implements you can sort of feel just how much give a tissue has, and you can feel that with your hands too. There are certain spots on it that you can press right into, but certain spots, it'll fight you really hard just on a superficial level. And those, your tissues should be able to take pressure, and they should also be pliable enough that you can press into them, preferably without pain. So if you find a spot that you can't, like even just lightly touching it causes discomfort, then you know, put some pressure there and you can work through that, clear that up, change it, So for the beginner, I think most people, when they feel pain, that's where they want to put the pressure. The same with the massage, that's where they feel they're getting effect. That's a good uh, a starting point. In my experience, yeah, that can be a good tell. It doesn't necessarily mean, like it doesn't have to hurt to work either, especially from the recovery standpoint and just trying to get that effect out of it. <clears throat> but yeah, that can definitely be a good indicator that that's something that needs do, to be worked do on. Do people need like a pain pill or a boomstick to start tempering or is there other ways, more simple ways Not to do it? Like you can use a foam roller. That stuff just works extra well because you don't have to, for instance, roll all your quads and hold a plank position over. You can actually let your body relax and just focus on the tissue that you're trying to affect change in.